Viva Cristo Rey. Long live Christ the King. Those are the words, the last words of Blessed Miguel Pro. It might be Saint Miguel Pro right now, I'm not sure. But Blessed Miguel Pro, this, this Mexican priest who died uh, by firing squad. His final words, Viva Cristo Rey. Long live Christ the King. Uh, this man who was living during a time when it was illegal uh, to to be a priest, to act as priest. And uh, they caught him and they were going to kill him. Final words, long live Christ the King. That's what we're talking about. Beautiful. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get into it. Okay. Before we get into it, let's pray. That's that's what we should do. That's always the best thing to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just take a minute to reflect on our day up to this point, whether it is early in the day, or late in the day, or anything in between, and just reflect on everything that has taken place, everything that we hope to take place throughout the rest of the day, any worries, any place of excitement, joy, and just imagine yourself offering it all to the Father, giving it to Him, surrendering it to Him and to His will. Truly, Father, we pray that Your will would be done, not ours. We ask for Your blessing, for Your grace, and for clarity of mind, especially as we study Your Word, Your Gospel, Jesus Christ, the King. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let's get into it. The Gospel of Luke. So this is this is the last time that you're going to hear from the Gospel of Luke for like three years at Mass, um, a Sunday Mass. You'll hear from the Gospel of Luke if you ever go to a weekday Mass. Uh, the, the weekday schedule is, you know, we kind of go through all three Gospels, I think, every year. I think that's true. Um, and uh, but, but on Sundays, like, Next next Sunday, you're going to hear from the Gospel of Matthew, and you'll hear from the Gospel of Matthew or John for uh, like three uh, for the year, and then Mark, and then finally Luke. Uh, Christmas might be a little bit different. Uh, the holidays, the holy days, they they have um, different different Gospel passages. So you you may hear from Luke. You probably will hear from Luke actually at Christmas because that's where the big nativity story is. But but nonetheless, like this this might be it. So anyway, say your final goodbyes to Luke. Of course, you're always free to read. You're always free to read the Gospels in, in your, your free time. So anyway, we're in, in Luke chapter 23, verses 35 to 43. Luke 23, verses 35 to 43. Um, yeah, that's that's it. Let's, let's read it. The people stood by and watched. So Jesus is cru he's being crucified. The people stood by and watched. The rulers, meanwhile, sneered at him. And said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. Even the soldiers jeered at him as they approached to offer him wine. They called out, If you are the king of if you are king of the Jews, save yourself. Above him there was an inscription that read, This is the King of the Jews. Now one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other, however, rebuking him, said in reply, Have you no fear of God? For you are subject to the same condemnation. And indeed, we have been condemned justly, for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied to him, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, well, I think, I think, what's the first natural question that comes to your mind? For me, why in the world would we read this passage on the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe? Wouldn't we, wouldn't it be more fitting to read a passage that talks about how Jesus reigns, you know, about how he is more powerful than anything, how he's more powerful than, than death, more powerful than the grave, more powerful than, than the rulers of the people who ruled over him and who crucified him. Why wouldn't we read about that? And I think, I think this, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It seems like, it doesn't seem like, I'm pretty sure this is what the church is trying to do, is to point us to a different kingdom. You know this, that, that when Jesus is questioned by Pilate, for sure in the Gospel of John, maybe in the other Gospels, but for sure in the Gospel of John, when Jesus is questioned by Pontius Pilate, um, are you a king? Uh, where, where is your army? Where are your people defending you? Jesus says, my kingship is not of this world. 
And and so in in a very real way, we need to understand that Jesus, his his kingdom, his kingship, it's of course we know this. It's in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And so for Jesus to come here to earth, it's he's 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 coming into a different kingdom that's not his. And so in some ways he he has to subject himself to this other king kingdom. Now we know, of course, that that he's working here. He's he's not a passive person uh, on the cross. We know that he's actually at work and he's going to war from, he's invaded actually. It's not just that, that he's kind of come and, you know, <laughs> his vacation didn't work out. No, we know that Jesus has invaded from his kingdom to this kingdom. But, but nonetheless, on the surface, it, se it seems like, and it's a very real thing, that he has to s subject himself to the rule of this other kingdom. Um, all, you know, in, in his master plan to to conquer this other kingdom, but but nonetheless, he, he has to make it seem like like he's he's this victim here, and he is a victim for for sure. But but nonetheless, he's 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 at work. So I think that's that's a really important point to point out. Now let's let's go through this. Okay, so we've talked about how David was the Christ, right? David was the Anointed One. That word Christ it means Anointed One. That was two videos ago, uh, and now Jesus comes, and it says if. Uh, He's the Messiah. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. I, I think it's it's fascinating. So our, the translation we're going to hear at Mass is slightly different. It says, if he's the chosen one, the Christ of God. Right? So Jesus is the anointed one. He is He's the successor, actually, to King David. So his kingdom, in some ways, is of this world, except that the kingdom of Israel has been conquered and is, is being oppressed right now by the Roman governor, the Roman Empire. Um, so... So while he is, he's technically, I mean, in a, in a way, very real way, he's king of Israel. He's he's the anointed one, the Christ of, of God, just like David was the Christ. Um, at the same time, that, that kingdom doesn't really exist on earth uh, in the same way that it did in David's time. So so I think that's, that's an, an important point. So then with that in mind, right, they're like, okay, well, if you're the Christ of God, right, you have all this power. Let... They're mocking him. This and this is this is the thing to me that whenever I read about the crucifixion scenes, this this mockery of Jesus. You know, you gotta you gotta try to imagine being Jesus. Of course, he thinks differently than we think. So so he wouldn't. He, to him, it's like this is all going according to plan. But then, in a very real way, you know, he's he's being rejected by his people, his creatures, his favorite creatures. He, he's being rejected by them. And so you just got to kind of a, like be with him on the cross. In fact, there's there's a, a, a lower lowercase t tradition of, of people just reflecting and meditating of, of how they might comfort Jesus while he's being crucified by his own people. How, how might you comfort someone who's who comes to earth to save his people and then those very people reject him? Well, you, you might comfort him by, by loving him, you know, uh, by going out of your way to perform acts of, of love, sacrificial love for him, just as he is sacrificing himself for you to, to make his sacrifice not be in vain. You know, so I think, I think that's just something really beautiful that, that we can reflect on. Jesus Christ, our King, comes and he, he, he's mocked, he's scourged, he's spit upon, he's, he's crucified, stripped, naked, crucified, uh, and dies, you know. This is our king, you know, and and so shouldn't we follow, shouldn't we follow his example, uh, in in sacrificing ourselves for him? I, I, this actually this makes me think of you know go back to the back to the first reading, uh, the people the tribes all the tribes come to David and say we are your bone and your flesh, right? And this this brought us back to the memory of of Genesis chapter two, where Dave uh, where Adam says to Eve this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, um, this this familial covenantal relationship that David has with with his people and the people have with him this this sort of it's it's familial yes but also marital in in a in a different kind of way maybe where where they're they're giving themselves to each other and now now Jesus right he's this is his covenant that he's establishing uh, we know he established it or, or he he pronounced it at the last supper uh, and now this is where he's he's giving himself to his people as a covenantal sacrifice. Uh, and so for us to respond, to, to comfort him, to love him on the cross, is, is to give ourselves to him in return in, in a covenantal reality uh, where Jesus marries his bride, the church, and his, his church marries Jesus, their king and spouse. Uh, beautiful, really beautiful thing. Okay, so what, what else do we got? So uh, the sign that is above Jesus' head, right? Uh, this is... Uh, what the king of the Jews uh, 
they they mean it to mock, right? They mean it to be mocking. But we, of course, know this, uh, that it is, in fact, the king of the Jews. In some ways, it's a real prophecy. They don't realize it's a prophecy, uh, a, an awareness or a, a knowledge of what God is doing and what God is speaking. It's very real. Uh, and so, in some ways, today, you know, we still have this reality that if we, if we truly claim Jesus Christ as our king, right? What is, what is a king? A king has absolute authority over a person. And so, if I proclaim that Jesus Christ is my king, and so he's the one, ultimately, who rules over my life, that, that I sub submit myself to his rule, that is actually going to bring about a lot of mockery. You know, we, we know lots of Christians who maybe will, will verbally give their assent to Jesus, but when push comes to shove, they're going to choose their own will, their own desires over the desires of Jesus. We know this to be the case because most people don't even, most people aren't even interested in, in the desires of Jesus, in, in the word of God. And so if they're, not, if they're not reading his commandments, reading his words, uh, going to him in prayer, then they're ultimately not really interested in Jesus' rule and his kingship. Um, but for us, right, for us who want to, to claim Jesus and live with Jesus as our king, you know, we, we get into the word. We, we spend time studying. And it's not like we're superior to these other people. It's just that we need, we need to try to help other people come, come under the rule of Jesus, even while we ourselves work on more and more giving ourselves to the rule of Jesus, surrendering and submitting ourselves to him. Um, okay, now, now this, this is an interesting thing that I, I just pointed out, or that I thought. Um, so the, the, the two criminals, right? The one who has the conversion, it seems, and the one who reviles Jesus. I was thinking about, if you remember the first reading from last week, uh, where... Where, what does it say? The, the prophet Malachi talks about the day of the Lord coming like a blazing oven, uh, where those who are proud and evildoers, they will be stubble. The day is coming that will set them on fire, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to burn them up. Compared to those who fear the Lord's name, there will arise the Son of Justice with its healing rays. And I was thinking about this. There, of course, is, is the bad thief, right? The one who, who, what? It says he reviled Jesus. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Right? If, if you're the Christ, just do something, right? You, you can do it. And you think of all the people in the world who, who, who come to Jesus without submitting to him, just making bold demands, and they simply won't be satisfied unless he does whatever their whims desire, right? But, but for this guy, right, the proud and evildoers. And so what does he do? He's, he's burning with anger toward Jesus. He's burning with anger toward him. So he's like, aren't you the Christ? Mocking him. Just do something about it, right? Compared to the other thief, the other thief who what have you no fear of God right he, he he comes to this place where before he was he was a criminal he, he, he was a justly condemned man he was a criminal have you no fear of God he's brought under this place where he fears the Lord's name and because he fears the Lord's name what does he hear from Jesus amen I say to you today you will be with me in paradise there will arise the son of justice with his healing rays oh man I, I think that's it's so incredible, right? Like there's a living example in front of us today in our gospel of what we heard in the first reading last week, a living example of someone who is proud and evil doing. And so therefore he burns with anger against the Lord God, against Jesus, compared to someone who was brought under a fear of the Lord's name. And now he is healed for Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, so I, th I think it's just so cool, you know, like that, that one, we can have a conversion at any time, right? That, the, that we're never beyond God's grace. All we have to do is receive the gospel, repent and believe in him. And he can, he, you know, cry out to him, Jesus, remember me, remember me to be brought under this place of the fear of the Lord's name, submitting to his rule. Um, but, but then like this very real thing that if we see people who are angry uh, at the Lord, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they've been really hurt by people. Maybe, maybe they've had false expectations of, of what it means to believe in Jesus, whatever, but they're, they're really angry, you know, uh, they're, they're proud and evildoers and, and we need to pray for them and, and maybe help them come to a place of coming under the fear of the Lord. Uh, but, but for us who fear his name, right, he really can heal and really will heal as he promises he will. Now, just, just the last thing, I think one, one little point. So this, this last line here, uh, amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What, is, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, it's not, it's not entirely clear, but it seems like the word paradise, it doesn't necessarily mean heaven. It might mean heaven, but, 
But according to what we believe, you know, Jesus, after he died, he didn't go straight to heaven, but he descended into the realm of the dead, uh, where the righteous souls are waiting for him. And so I've, I've read a couple of commentaries that talk about this word paradise, not meaning heaven, but it, instead it means going to the place where righteous souls are awaiting the Messiah. In other words, it's like, it's like this, this guy, the good thief, is going to accompany Jesus as he goes down to liberate those souls who have been waiting for the Messiah, waiting for the day. All of the souls, the good and righteous souls who lived uh, in, in Old Testament times, uh, just waiting, waiting for the Messiah to come so that Jesus can release them from their bondage and bring them up into heaven. And so it's not that necessarily the good thief is going straight to heaven because Jesus doesn't even go straight to heaven, but instead he goes down. And so this guy, it's like he gets to accompany Jesus, you know, which is in some ways maybe maybe a more incredible gift, uh, maybe. Uh, but but nonetheless, that, that's, that's one possibility. Um, another possibility is that, so in, in Greek, trend, uh, punctuation isn't is not written in. And so another person suggested, or a few other people suggested that, that maybe the phrase could be spoken differently rather than amen, 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 I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Another person said, amen, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So in other words, it's, it's not Jesus saying when you will go to paradise, but, but that I'm saying it to you today that you will in fact be with me in paradise at some point in the future. Um, anyway, I th I, we don't, we, we're not required to believe either one or any of those those three. I think it's just something that's that's just worth our reflection, uh, that the Lord, he wants us maybe to reflect on it. And uh, and more than anything, I think to trust in his mercy, to trust that when we call out to him for mercy, our king, his rule, which sometimes might seem demanding, his rule, which might, might sometimes seem like it's it's too much, it's, it's a bit extra. No matter what, our king, his rule is merciful. It is good, it is generous, it is kind. And more than anything, it defeats evil. And so if we find ourselves in a place of evil, to surrender to him and ask him to transfer us, as we heard in our second reading, to transfer us from the kingdom of death into his kingdom of life. Ooh, that's our king. Brothers and sisters, let us rejoice that we have such a king and let us place ourselves under his authority, under his rule, under his kingship. Viva Cristo Rey. Amen.